Good afternoon, everyone. It is three minutes past five. And um, I think in the interest of keeping time, we should begin. And I'm sure there will be more participants joining us um, as we go along. So good afternoon to all. My name is Uma Kolamparimbo. I'm the head of school of economics and finance, or CEF as we are known otherwise, at the University of Witwatersrand. I have the pleasure of welcoming each of you to today's webinar, which is part of the CEF webinar series on engaging with with alumni as we undertake our journey towards the WIT centenary celebrations of 2022. Today's event is second in the series, and we are fortunate to have with us Ms. Bongi Kunene, the Managing Director of the Banking Association of South Africa, to speak to us on the topic of commercial banking as social good. As you're aware, South Africa's economic inequality, despite our best attempts, has continued to increase post-democracy. And in a society dubious for its income and economic inequality, as one of the worst in the world, the access to finance is considered to be one of the most impenetrable barriers which stand in the way of breaking the vicious cycle of intergenerational mobility and sustaining poverty and underdevelopment. So despite South Africa having one of the most robust financial systems, not just in Africa, but I would say amongst the middle income countries. Unfortunately, we also have very low levels of financial inclusion and access to banking amongst our population. So the conventional banking or borrowing from a commercial banks, the model that requires collateral and prohibitive costs of banking really is standing in the way of access to, to the population that need seed capital so direly to create employment for ourselves and development for the country. So it is therefore, I think, very important to initiate this conversation and look beyond conventional banking models and the role of banks and introduce the concept of social lending and the expectation of from commercial banks with regard to this. So I'm very excited that today we have the best possible speaker to raise some of these issues and create the platform for us to engage more deeply on this topic. Ms. Kunene, prior to taking on the role of managing director of the Banking Association of South Africa in March, 2020, led the Pan-African Division for Public Sector Banking for Standard Bank Group. Her responsibilities included strategic direction for business among 15 African countries, including South Africa under that portfolio. Her career has spanned many roles, many entities. She has served as the executive director at the World Bank Group in Washington, DC. And she chaired the audit committee of the World Bank Group from November, 2016 to October, 2018. Bongi has also served in the South African government in various capacities, including the presidency, the national treasury, as well as the provincial government's finance and economics affairs. She has served as the director on the board of Sandparks, where she chaired the audit committee. She has served as the chairperson of 
the um, Richards Bay Industrial Development Zone. So her career has spanned many entities and we can therefore claim that she would be the most appropriate person to address the, the topic this morning. Um, I'm very happy that WITS can claim association with her and we are proud of Bongi's connection with WITS where she started off her studies um, in post-graduation in um, economics, but then continued through and finished it um, at SOAS, University of London. I do not wish to stand between the audience and um, our esteemed speaker anymore. So I will hand over the mic to uh, Ms. Konene, um, who can continue the presentation for the next 30 to 40 minutes. And then thereafter, if the audience can hold the questions to the end, we will have a Q&A and a discussion session. So over to Ms. Kunene. The pain of our lives. You speak and you are muted. <laughs> Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, for the introduction and to everybody who is online, I will start with the disclaimers. Uh, the first one being in terms of data that I'm using. I am using internal BASA data, but we also have external sources. So we've attributed uh, those sources as we go along. What you will see is that our cycles of data verification uh, take a year or more. So there are some examples where I'm going to use 2018, others 2019. And if it is internal BASA data, I will be bold enough to use 2020. So I'll start with uh, just explaining the mandate of uh, BASA. We are owned completely by uh, our members. So if you are looking for our classification in terms of how we are registered, we are a trade association. And all our members hold licenses to operate as banks. And whenever we engage on behalf of our members, we usually are working with policymakers, legislators, regulators, and the public at large, including yourselves as we have today. And in terms of our mandate, it's also the driving force is to ensure that our members comply with the code of banking practice, which is enforced by one of our regulators, FISCA. And our members, whenever there are issues that impact our consumers and the public in how they interact or consume the products that come from our members, we always commit our members to the outcome of whatever will come out of the Ombudsman for Banking Services. So that being the case, my next slide can now talk to what BASA does. Uh, basically, if you want to be simplistic, we do two things. We are a platform for common solutions uh, to problems that are faced by the banking industry. And we always consult our members whenever there is new legislation or new regulations or social issues that have an impact on banks. We do want you to know at the outset that we do not engage at all on business operations on behalf of our members because as banks, they are extremely well capable of doing that themselves. The BASA platform does not allow for competitive uh, behavior. I mean, for anti-competitive behavior. So we explicit about that in the sense of saying anyway in public that this is a platform that excludes anti-competitive behaviors. And members, our members can be expelled if for whatever reason they have brought 
the industry into, disrep into disrepute. So why do banks exist to answer your question? Because you have tried, you have asked us to talk about um, the bank's raison, raison debt. And that reason for the bank's existence is basically, in a nutshell, the arbitrator of savings and investments in an economy. So I want to start by giving you a complete figure of uh, last year published by the Reserve Bank in terms of other people's money that is held by the banks. That is 6.6 .6 trillion rands. So how do the banks fund themselves? They do borrow and the borrowings that they do amount to 4%. They uh, issue bonds and they hold bonds as well. And that is at 7%. They also have other liabilities, which would be at 8%. Each of the banks have shareholders and shareholders capital for South African banks in total is 8%. And the vast amount of holdings by the banks is depositors money, which is at 4.2 trillion rents, which is 73% of what is held by the banks. Continuing with what the banks, our reason for existence, our member reasons for existence, you will know that banks are licensed to accept these deposits. And they make loans out of the savings and investments. But the real commodity, the highest commodity held by banks is trust. This is the trust of individuals, households, companies, because it is based on the banks, on their ability to access their funds on demand. What the banks really do in the final instance is banks exist to be facilitators of economic activity, heavily supervised and regulated. In the South African context, the banks are supervised by the Reserve Bank, the Prudential Authority, the Financial Sector Conduct Authority, because of the Twin Peaks model that we have, which established the PA and FISCA. But on credit matters, the um, regulator is the national credit regulator as established by the National Credit Act. And there is also the Competition Commission, which looks at all companies in terms of uh, competitive behavior. So I want to touch base just a little bit on regulation in my next two slides. So the regulation framework in South Africa, the philosophy behind it is that it wants to ensure that we have a sound financial system at the same time protect all users of financial services. And our REG universe is informed by the law. The legislation, there are different pieces of uh, legislation. A lot of people will know the Banks Act, but they are much more than just the Banks Act. Um, I would say I would include the Companies Act, but also for information purposes, there is PAIJA, there is um, PAIA. So in terms of administrative justice, we are just, the banks operate just like any other company. When they are required to provide information, they have to give that information. The terms and conditions for extending loans and other services um, that are offered by the banking community, they are laid down in these pieces of legislation and I would say, again, the philosophy behind all of those 
would be to protect the depositor's interests, which is why there's this inbuilt conservative bias that people normally talk about when they refer to banks. But there are, each of the banks that operates has got its own environment for controls. And the enforcers of that environment for controls would be the boards of the banks. And externally, the governance of the banks is enforced through regulatory and supervisory framework. So having said that, looking at what we are looking, I mean, we are discussing this afternoon, I would say in the role of financing economic growth, the banks exercise rights on the 6.6 .6 trillion of assets which they hold. And this exercise of rights comes through extension of loans, through encouraging business investments, which is where most commercial banks are active. And it also comes through whenever banks finance economic infrastructure, either government's economic infrastructure directly or the state-owned companies. And in everything that banks do, they also seek to expand economic capacity. So if I can just direct you to the picture, uh, the chart in front of us, you will see that the total assets, the decomposition of the total assets of the banks, there is a bit of central bank money, which is central bank money and gold deposits that banks hold, which is at 3%. Then there are other assets, which are usually in the form of trust uh, at 9%, and the government treasury bills at 5%. Then there are equities, which are not heavy in terms of the asset classes held by South African banks. They come in only at 1%. And then private sector bonds, this is a market in South Africa that still needs further development. It's a mere 2% of bank holdings. And the, the way in which banks fund themselves, you will see that they have 9% of government bonds. So in total, banks exposure to government, either through the bills, the treasury bills, or the bonds that we hold would be at 14%. And the vast majority of the funding structure of the banks in terms of loans and investments at 71% will be loans. So, this is how at the back of the banks, we have the financing of economic growth. And I want to continue with this theme because once you've seen that at 71%, we have the, we have the loans, then further decomposition in the next slide will show you that of all the loans that banks hold, they come in different product houses. So the first product house would be the overdrafts, loans and advances, including those that are made to companies at 32%. This is the core of what banks do with the loan in terms of their portfolio. They finance individuals and companies through these overdrafts and direct loans, uh, and they come in in different product forms. And to households, including that which is financed by commercial banks, which is um, mortgages for, for um, business operations, um, that is another huge chunk of um, how the banks facilitate uh, economic growth with 33% of mortgages. 
Now, there are other loans. Like I've said, we have different products and I'm not going to talk about product specific issues because as BASA, I really do not enter at that level. I am talking to you from outside of the envelope. I'm not diving in into what each bank's products and services would look like. So other loans will be at 19%. Then there are installments and leases at 10%, uh, credit cards at, 10, at um, 3%. And you will know that most of the time there is room for defaults. And you see those defaults and non-performing loans and all the credit impairments sitting at 3%, which by the way, tell you that South African banks are very, very healthy. Now, to talk about the health of the banks, we will have to go to the next slide, which is on earnings. And I'll talk just briefly using 2019 as an example compared to 2020. So in 2019, the banks generated a total profit of 88.7 billion rand compared to the profit, um, quite a sharp drop when you look at the numbers declared last year in 2020, where the profits dropped to 34.8 billion. And that's really because of COVID. So you can, you can see the sharp impact of the pandemic on financing of economic growth. South Africa's growth last year was negatively impacted, but we are not unique because other economies also suffered the same. But if you were to say, let's look at the, um, what these profits speak to. They really speak to the ability of the banking community to add to capital, thus enabling self-generated growth, which then powers the South African economy because that is how they are able to direct those profits into new loans and increase lending year on year. So when you look at the bar charts in this slide, you will see that between 2017 and 2018, there's a 4.6% growth trajectory. So it's quite marginal. However, the story is not that the lending uh, ability grew 4.7% up 4.6%. The real story is on how do banks maintain the ability to grow, add to capital, have sustainable profits. And you would see that 55% of the profits, or in this case, the exact number 46 billion in 2018, it was paid to shareholders. And this includes the pension funds, uh, foreign investors, insurance companies, BE schemes, and one of the biggest shareholders of the banks is the PIC. They own a combined total, depending on which bank you are looking at, of 6% right up to 14%. And also, GEPF, which is the Government Employees Pension Fund, invest in the banking sector, and they also have a sizable uh, proportion of the profits in terms of the dividends that are declared. What is remarkable with 2020 is that most banks did not declare dividend because the situation was quite dire. What they did do instead was to put up a lot of money in the first half of earnings, and that money put up was for provisions in case of non-performing loans. So you'll see in the next slide that I'm talking about capital creation, 
because there is an imperative on banks to be profitable, but also to be sustainable. So what they do as a normal force of just doing their business, they lend, they absorb losses, and they distribute profits to shareholders. As I've said earlier, they have substantial exposure to sovereign risk because of government bonds and the financing of state-owned companies. As most of you would know, for the past five years, there have been talk on who poses the most risk. And in terms of the state-owned companies, you would hear of ESCOM mentioned in that category, but increasingly more state-owned companies have become riskier. Uh, with the land bank sometime last year being unable in the first half of 2020 to honor its obligation to its creditors. So what that has done to the country, South Africa Inc is we now hold a non-investment credit rating. That has the, it has an impact on the bank's ability to source funding for themselves, including sourcing funds from international sources. Um, we have a sharp correction in this year's earnings. All the banks have declared their earnings starting in June, to August, that was a period of uh, declaring the first half of uh, 2021 earnings. We will see that this year, so far, the banks have made 40 billion in profit. This is not the same as the profits which I showed in 2017 and 2018, because these figures for first half of 2021, really ref reflect that the banks have pulled back on the provisions which were made last year for foreseen losses for 2020 and the years ahead. So in terms of how the banks conduct themselves, maybe the biggest issue that I want to highlight in the next slide is on the jobs and taxes. If you, so, and in this case, I'm not going to talk about banks alone. The figures I'm going to use are for the whole financial services industry as a whole. So in this case, financial services pay 36% of all corporate tax in South Africa, despite the fact that they only make 23% of GDP. In terms of employment, the figures I'm using are up to the beginning of 2020, where the six largest banks employed 163,000 people. This on top of the banks shedding some of the roles which are available because of digital journeys, which they've all been on for the last 10 or so years. So in terms of employment trends, uh, the banks um, have been trending higher than everybody. And in this case, everybody being mining construction and manufacturing and government, because you can see the numbers. This is the trend analysis for growth in employment figures up to March, 2019. And what really so I've spoken about the banks being the driver for financing economic growth for South Africa, but the banks themselves have their own architecture, which is underpinned by the national payments system, which is my next slide. So what really happens in the velocity of money? Whenever there is a salary paid to a bank or there is a bank transfer or there is a card that is being swiped in a store or in any transaction platform, the banks in turn will use the national payment system. 
So the system I'm using 2020 numbers handles 895 billion a month. And this amounts to 100 million individual transactions per month. And that gives us an average of uh, 20 million transactions uh, per minute. This is done in this architecture, there's BASA, there's PASA. PASA is the Payments Association of South Africa, and there's BankSelf, which is the payment rails, which does the settlements for each transaction. So if you look at 2019, the banks reported um, 175,580 suspicious transactions out of more than 100 million individual transactions. In some instances, these suspicious transactions had nothing illegal per se or anything untoward. What was really happening is that some transactors, individuals or companies, deposited physical cash. And the law in South Africa does not allow individuals to deposit physical cash more than 24,999 rents. So when these deposits happen, they are not rejected, but they are reported. So that if there is any suspicious activity on this physical cash, it is then researched by the Financial Intelligence Center. And what is remarkable about South Africa's payment system is that our rails also on a monthly basis handle 12.5 million social grants um, per month. So I want to skip to the next slide and talk a little bit about a vexing issue in terms of what, what frustrates most people when they say, but there's a lot of uh, profit. We don't know whether there's transformation or not in banking. So I'm using BASA figures in this case. So we've seen quite an uptick in transformation figures in terms of um, the banks. I will start by looking at voting rights. Um, the change was from 30.5% to 34.8. Um, this is year on year changes. And when you look at the most marginalized section of society, which is black women, their voting rights increased from 13 to 13.8. And I'm going to talk about directors and shareholders a bit later. So another statistic between 2016 and 2017 is on economic interest. It increased year on year from 25.3 to 30.1. And for black women, it increased from 11.4% to 12%. So these are not the only metrics. I'm just using this bar these bars as an example. I also have lots more figures in terms of procurement and in terms of total spends for the banks, uh, who financed who. So there was 20, 21 billion, which was used to finance black SMEs. And then black farmers were financed to the tune of 19 billion. And the transformation in the workforce is probably the biggest for 2020 because the years we are measuring start in 2016 right up to 2020 where you see that 65 percent of management of banks is now not white but at senior management because we're talking junior middle and senior at senior management we still have 43% levels being black. I'll continue with um, my story on transformation. Now talking about the board of directors, 
In 2019, 44% of the board of directors, that's my next slide, it's um, black. And my big issue is really the effect of transformation on black consumer education, particularly people who are either buying property for the first time or doing very large purchases. What has happened here in terms of financial inclusion is that we have moved and spent up to 212 million in 2019. The exposure to BE deals dropped. And this is an indication of the economic conditions in the country. Because previously, up to 2018, the figures were at um, 107 billion. And in 2019, we dropped 35%. So over years, bank black ownership measures have declined. Again, I'm talking 2016 to 2019. Reason being, some of the shares have vested, which allows the initial shareholders to, to sell their shares on the open market, which would be at the JSE. So there is an aggregate target of 25%, which is laid down by the financial sector code. However, I don't want to use 25% as a yardstick because that is a guideline in the codes, which is why I am sticking to the fact that the, the ownership trends show a decline. It is still above 25%, which on its own is commendable, but the changing of shares in terms of ownership has meant that there's a decline in black ownership. And lastly, I want to talk about um, the spend on socioeconomic development, which has also dropped in 2020. Uh, it dropped by 8% to 621 million, again, a reflection of the socioeconomic conditions and the difficulty in moving out of uh, profits to uh, CSI budgets and other socioeconomic budget spend. And I want to zoom in on my next slide to financial inclusion directly. In this slide, I'm not going to take you through each of the, bar, of the bars, safe to say that the number of active accounts have been falling. Starting in 2018 to 2019, that is indicative of economic participation. The more people do not have jobs, the more they close accounts. So I want to do an illustration now because we are talking about banks being a force of uh, being a social uh, good, commercial banks in this case. And I want to do a case study with COVID-19 relief in my next slide. So you will see in this slide that I have in the box, the information on what the banks did together with government. But I want to start with what the banks did on their own. These figures were verified by the Reserve Bank in their financial sustainability report of May this year, the banks were able to restructure the loans of clients, both commercial clients and corporate clients. So commercial banking clients would sit at retail level and the amount of restructuring that was done for those clients is at 128 billion rands, whereas the amount of restructuring that was done for corporate and investment banking clients stands at 165 billion. But for disclosure, I want to go into the program that we did 
on behalf of government. Firstly, there was no shortage of liquidity from the banking system. So what the banks did to support the government initiative of shoring up the economy was to create this uh, work on a scheme created by National Treasury called the Loan Guarantee Scheme. In final instance, what that scheme provided to the economy was far less than the projected 40 billion that we thought will be given in the best case. And we had thought that the worst case would be 24 billion rand extended. We only managed to do 20 billion on that score. And this box here has got all the numbers for you. Loans not taken up, loans approved and taken up, loans approved, clients choosing not to take them up. When the scheme ended in July, 2021, there were still about 5% of the loans who were work in progress. And those loans were the loans where the clients never provided sufficient information. And we have the exact number of the loans which were declined and the loans which were rejected. So this is the sum total of that 20 billion, which was the loan guarantee scheme where we worked with uh, the government. My next slide, I'm moving away from this uh, case study. And I think I want to just zoom in on what the banks do on SMME funding. This is a highly contested landscape and the banks are not alone in providing finance uh, to um, commercial banking clients, which normally would be SMMEs. Banks in 2018 provided 70% of the loans, which in uh, reserve bank figures would show that the loans that went to this sector equaled 230 billion rands. The issue for the banks, which is a perennial issue, is the risk appetite and the interest rates. So each of the banks will have their declared risk appetite and the interest that they can charge for whatever product they are extending in the form of loans. And that calibrates into the 70%. The rest of the funding in this 230 billion would have come from venture capital, which is still quite small in South Africa. And another chunk would come from the development uh, finance agencies. Some of these development finance agencies, the majority are government owned, but some would be in the form of philanthropy and other organizations. What is new and growing and helping the SMME sector is the use of technology in processing these loans, because what we are seeing now is significant cost reduction. But in everything that the SMMEs bring to the table, there's always the contestation. Are you dealing with a form of a product that requires a lot of innovation? In the assessment done by the banks, is that new innovation viable? This is difficult to assess in most cases because it is forward leaning. And if you don't have a model that captures something in the future, or it is an enterprise that's trying to do something that has not been done before, you then are faced with an equation of all things being true in terms of your risk appetite, what will you select to fund? And as you engage with a client, do you want to do the traditional core business of banking, 
which is advancing debt finance, or are you going to go the equity route? And that, Prof, is really about ultimately the operating conditions that the banks face day on day-to-day -day basis. So on my next slide, looking at these um, operating conditions, I've spoken of the payment systems. I think what I need to highlight is that the operating environment has got parameters. And these parameters in terms of how the regulations are undertaken, they are very strict, they are very intrusive because the aim is to detect crime and also to enforce anti-money anti laundering laws. Because South African banks subscribe to international standards, which are usually in the G20 platform, we have subscribed to all measures on combating of financing of terrorism and detecting, tracing, reporting, extracting any form of illicit transactions. The identification, which is the first step of suspicious uh, transactions is done according to the Financial Intelligence um, Center Act. In 2019, we established a PPP, which we call the uh, South African Money uh, Summit. How can I forget what it stands for? I'm going to remember when you ask me uh, questions, but it's a form of collaboration and coordination between the banking industry, other financial services provider, providers, and the regulators, not just FIC, so it would be FIC, competition law, and NCR, and other aspects of regulation which will go which will go and extend to the tribunal and other settlement activities. And lastly, whenever there is proof that we now have suspicious transactions or risk which the banks cannot accept, there will be account closures because once that risk is high, Thank you so much, James, for explaining Samlit. <laughs> Once we have those accounts, we then impinge on the contractual relationship between a bank and a client. So I would like to end here and take questions if there are any. Thank you very much again for the invitation. Um, Prof was very kind in explaining my association with VETS. In my own words, I'm a dropout at this. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Abonki. Uh, that was highly enlightening. Um, we've got a peek into the complex world of banking. I now open up uh, the flow for questions from the audience. I would request you to please raise your hands and then we can give you the microphone. I don't see any hands. Um, so let me then, who's here? Oh, okay. I'm not able to. Okay, Tendai. So go for it, Tendai. Can you unmute? Uh... Tendai, please unmute yourself and speak. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure if I'm unmuted. I can hear you now. Go ahead. All right. Uh, just to thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Kunene, for the very interesting uh, presentation. 
I, um, I have uh, some questions and uh, perhaps some few uh, comments as well. Uh, <clears throat> so my first, uh, my first uh, question is around um, financial inclusion. Uh, if you look at the statistics, uh, some reports by some um, uh, research, for example, done by Finmark, it states that uh, about 77% of South Africans have a banking account. So when you look at that indicator alone, it really shows that uh, it seems financial inclusion in South Africa is, is quite high. But when you look at the usage of those accounts, you then note that uh, uh, only 24% uh, uh, use those accounts three times per month. So a significant number of those account holders are really not using uh, those accounts efficiently. So uh, th the question then is how are banks encouraging the, the, the usage of those accounts. One possible reason has been that perhaps those accounts are quite expensive, so the consumers uh, are not really using them as efficiently as one would, would, would expect. Uh, so, so that's one, one question that I have. The other question is around the South African national payment system. Uh, there have been uh, studies that seem to suggest that one possible reason for that uh, lack of financial inclusion, uh, that is, the, uh, which doesn't just look at the, 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 the holding of an account, uh, is probably because there isn't competition at the payment system level itself. Uh, would you perhaps uh, uh, elaborate on, on those two issues? Okay, so we'll take another question um, and mm -hmm. then perhaps Ms. Kunene can answer them together. Um, yeah. Kenneth, go for it. Yes, hi there. Thank you so much, uh, Uma. Um, Bongi, I hope you're well. Um, I remember when, I'm sure you remember, we were in class together, in the honors class in the early 1990s when you were, when you were it, at WITS. It, it must be Kenneth Krimer. Yes, how are you? I'm good. Yeah, thank you. We were in class together with Lumkile and Siraj, and uh, we, we are hopefully, uh, it's a long time ago, but nice, lovely to see you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, just a few questions. The first one on this loan uh, guarantee uh, scheme. I've got the sense that there are some people uh, who feel that we should revisit it and improve the design because it wasn't effective enough. And I, I'm not sure if that is necessary. You know, I get a sense that um, they're almost looking backwards now and fighting the last war, you know, and saying, well, we should have designed it better, but uh, things have moved on. And I, I just wonder what you think about that, whether we should spend time and effort in trying to design it, the loan uh, scheme better for the future. And secondly, on the question of the, uh, the green transition in South Africa and the role of the banks. I just would be interested to know what your reflections are on that. You know, you, every now and then you read that certain banks are going to be uh, funding uh, electricity investments in renewable energy. Other banks are, um, are not uh, wanting to invest in, in dirty technology that might damage the climate environment. And I know internationally as well, Mark Carney and other central bankers are running projects where they're integrating finance and climate issues. So if you could just reflect on whether you're aware of such discussions and where they're at in, in this country. Thanks very much, Uma. Thank you, Bongi. Thank you, Kenneth. Um, so if that's okay with you, Ms. Kunene, let us um, allow you to respond because each um, the, the questions are sort of multiple uh, in their content. So perhaps it might get too complicated if you take more questions. Yeah. So let us perhaps give you an opportunity to first respond to Tendai and um, yeah. Kenneth, and then move on. So thanks for the question uh, questions, Tendai. Uh, the first one, the work that's been done by Finmark Trust, it's, we rely on it a lot when we 
search for data because it's an independent source of um, information and data analytics that's not driven by ourselves. Uh, so when they say that notwithstanding 77% 77, 77 coverage, usage is a 24%. It's not really a concern because you have to ask yourself, having a bank account, are you using the account as a store of value or are you using it for transactional activities? If you are using it for transactional activities three times a month, um, let's say you are an average family or average individual, I don't know if such a person exists, you would be getting a salary and from that salary there are deductions, you would be paying all your creditors, you will be doing your monthly investments and the incidentals. So interacting with your bank account three times a month is not a bad statistic. It becomes a poor statistic if it is indicative of inability to do more. So what Finmark Trust data has not given to us is a breakdown maybe by class level. If it were to say, how many times do high net worth individuals interact with their account and at each LSM, what is the level of interaction with the account? Then we will get granularity, which may give us a uh, reason for concern, but at this stage, it's just what it is. So it is not, it's neither bad nor good until we have more information. So you are asking if the banks are encouraging the use of accounts, they will always do so. Um, if you are just listening to whatever device um, as a form of radio or whatever, you will hear, you will be bombarded by bank advertisements and other financial service providers advertisement. What is really good in this current environment since 2018, 2019, with the introduction of the Twin Peaks model, is that even in those adverts, the banks are conscious of the need not to propagate any unfair lending practice. So it is all encouraging the use of accounts, but it is not like um, borrow, 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 borrow. They do talk about savings. They do talk about investments as well. So there's quite a lot of encouragement. And because we've got quite a, a number of new entrants into the banking environment in South Africa, there's even more in terms of what is available, which wants to promote the usage of accounts. So your question on whether the national payment system lacks competition, my take on it is that look at the Vision 2025 statement uh, in the um, national payment systems department of the, Res of the Reserve Bank you will see that that vision 2025 is talking about a payments modernization journey, which is putting more actors into the payment systems, I mean, to use the payment system. Because I'm part of the work that is being done, it is all undertaken by the Reserve Bank. I can share with you that uh, the first workshop I attended this year, on revisiting the payment system 
had more than 2000 participants. So the interest is very, very high. So we will see what emerges in terms of rules of engagement, in terms of uh, the risks attendant to the system, and in terms of uh, the legacy investments uh, that have been undertaken by current players. But the intention is for it to be very competitive going into the future. So Kenneth, I don't want to talk about the loan guarantee scheme version 2.0, save to say that my honest take on it is that um, government came in just way too late. Because when you compare the 293 billion to the 20 billion that was done under government supervision, it's not comparable. It doesn't really make sense um, to put them in one sentence. So if there's a desire to do uh, LGS 2.0, it won't have, the banks will not have a huge appetite for that. So looking at green finance and the role of banks, uh, you mentioned Mark Carney and others uh, in terms of the assets, particularly the coal powered assets that the banks hold, it's quite a huge debate. So what I can comment on is the fact that South Africa has joined the fray. We now have a number of um, social bonds issued in 2021. Uh, it was interesting that the country that was the front runner in this was Gabon, who would have thought we were not number one. Um, there is also a lot of activity on green finance. As you would know, some of BASA members last year executed those transactions and they even got awards, international awards. And there's a lot that we are looking at. Uh, I'll use this space to advertise, we will be having a sustainable finance conference on the 24th and 25th of November. It's free, you can log on, join the party. South Africa is working on this. Over to you, Prof. Fantastic, thank you for those comprehensive responses. Um, I'm not able to see hands anymore from my side, um, but I do see a couple of questions on the Q&A. Um, both are from Ruben Mohano, and I see the question on the LGS has already been answered from your side. So we will focus on the first question, which reads, how much of the total loan portfolio of 71%, which is ranked 4.4 trillion, go to black people? So th that seems to be the question from uh, Ruben, but I also had sort of a related uh, query. So perhaps I can um, combine it uh, together with Ruben and um, which is really relating to understanding the relationship between commercial banks in South Africa and its primary regulator, which is the Reserve Bank. Um, and trying to understand whether the Reserve Bank plays an active role in mandating um, the social development participation of commercial banks in South Africa, sort of along the lines of what we see in other countries like priority sector lending, which kind of mandates certain uh, assigned proportion of credit to go to certain priority areas such as agriculture, SMEs, um, and also increasing to women. So separate targets for women lending to women. So uh, do, do you see such proactive interventions from the Reserve Bank? Is there space for it? Um, what do you think would be the, the uh, path going forward? I would say not from the Reserve Bank, but there's a lot of shareholder activism in each of the banks in South Africa. So the social landscape 
and the need for transformation is very well known and pressing. So the amount of activity, each bank's activity that's directed to tr supporting transactions and in all segments that would be of a redressing nature has been increasing year on year for the past 15 years. And that is what we capture in our transformation report. So I don't have the number with me, how much goes uh, to black enterprises. But if you look at our transformation report, we will not be saying this X amount of loans were to black companies because the activities that you classify as black would also include um, the PIC, the GAPF, very big institutional investors. And I think the interest is not so much on institutional investors. Rather, it is on companies in the classification of Companies Act. And sometimes the interest is very much on SMMEs, which are black owned. And we have those figures. We are not the only authority with those figures. So if you look at the annual reports of several institutions, um, including business partners, including researchers, you will see that there's a lot of activity from state-owned companies, the DFAs, and also privately owned DFAs. So it's, as I said earlier, you would, the commercial banks still take a huge chunk. What it does say to me is that there's a need to diversify even more. And also there's a need for some sectors to grow faster. And I'll put venture capital in that respect of those that need to grow faster. And in terms of bond issuance, some of the landscape has not even been touched. For example, the use of our sea resources. Uh, South Africa does not have a blue bond. So there's quite a lot of scope for social bonds, blue bonds, green financing, and so on. Thank you. Um, I don't see any further questions. So let me use this opportunity to thank you wholeheartedly uh, on my personal behalf and that of the school for sparing time. Um, and, and this has been highly educational and enlightening, but also raised um, issues uh, perhaps that need to be addressed going forward. Um, and I would like to now hand over to James for the vote of thanks. Hi, thank, uh, thank you very much, pro, uh, Professor. Um, yes, this has been absolutely an amazing um, uh, presentation and I've been in finance now for over 30 years and I've learned a heck of a lot from the last four, uh, 40 minutes with regard to um, the, state, uh, the state of South, uh, South Africa's um, our banking si uh, system. What did interest you? interest me is how concentrated um, the banking system is in as much as it contributes 30, 36% in cor corporate tax and 23% um, um, in GDP. And, and it just shows the opportunities and challenges, um, both from the lending side, um, how um, our economy need, uh, needs growth, as well as the under, underlying risk, uh, uh, risk issues. Um, and Bongi touched, uh, touched up upon it um, in terms of uh, financial inclusion. If you don't have economic growth, your, your um, financial inclusion is gonna be pre, uh, pretty re uh, re uh, redundant. There's loads of opportunities in, in terms of um, sustain, um, sustain, sustain, su sustainable finance, um, 
and, and on the opposing side, it's the managing sustainable finance along with climate risk, um, which is a totally new, a new ball game. Um, uh, uh, Bongi also talk, um, talked about um, uh, the payment system and, and, op and opportunities and challenges as we move into a digital uh, um, um, in, um, environment. Um, and I think there's probably um, opportunities there for, uh, from an academic perspective, both in um, um, strategies, risk management, and um, the operating model. Um, so I'd like, like to say thank you so much to Bongi. It has been a really fascinating for, uh, 45 minutes, which have which has gone gone even even longer. And I'm really pleased this has been recorded because I know I'll I'll want to listen to this again, as I'm sure there'll be many um, stakeholders and students who who will also gain a lot a, a lot of value by. Uh, by listening to this. Thank you so much, Bongi. Thank Michelle. you very much for having me. <laughs>